What's up, Bridge students? Man, I am so excited to be here with you tonight. Hey, maybe you didn't know this, but we are actually one church in two locations. So right now, whether you're in Spring Hill or Columbia, can you just make some noise for all of Bridge students? Yes. Man, I'm so glad you guys are here with us tonight. As we continue in our series, I'm fine. Uh, if we've not met before, my name is Charlie. I am the student director here uh, at The Bridge. Uh, in this series, I'm fine. It's all about our emotions. It's all about the fact that we are dealing with things in our lives. And emotions aren't a bad thing, but they tell us something. See, emotions are like smoke to a fire. Smoke's not the problem, but the fire is. And so through this series, what we're trying to do is follow the smoke to the fires of our heart, because I think God wants us to realize kind of where we're at, what we're doing, uh, that honestly, they can be harmful to us, because we've looked at some emotions that unchecked can be dangerous or harmful to us, uh, relationships around us, friends, family, other people, and we don't want that. We want to make sure we are people that are operating in a healthy way, and so that's what we're going to do. Tonight, we're hitting the topic of anger. Uh, and if there were emotion that could hurt us, anger is obviously that emotion. Uh, man, it was so funny. Actually, as we were working on who should write uh, this series, uh, I was going back and forth. I asked Jeremiah to preach it. I talked about my wife preaching it. And everyone unanimously agreed, Charlie, you need to teach on anger. You're obviously the best choice. And that freaking pissed me off. How are you going to tell me I'm the best one to preach on anger? I'm like going off about it. I was like, oh, wait. Never mind. Obviously, I'm the best one to preach on anger as I'm literally angry at you about you wanting me to do it. There's probably at least 100 stories of anger I could tell you uh, from my time of middle school and high school alone, 100. There's probably 100,000. Here's a couple of them. In sixth grade, I remember we were playing uh, football uh, in PE, and I was quarterback. But Tyler Mims, he came and took the ball from me. So what I do? I got angry. I punched him in the back of the head, took the football. Son, I already told you I'm the quarterback, right? I was angry at him. Uh, eighth grade, J.D. Harris, one of my best friends, I asked him to be on my science fair team. We were going to make a project together. Uh, he told me, no, he was already on a project with another girl. That pissed me off. So screw you, JD. We're not friends anymore. Ninth grade, Jaleesa Brand. I was on the drum line. She stole my drumsticks. So what did I do? I threw her notebooks in the trash. Sorry, Jaleesa. She actually never knew that until probably right now. Uh, 11th grade, Jessica Edwards had a better car than me. And you probably think that's envy, not anger. Well, here's where the anger came in. She went to the principal and said that she should park closer to the door because the gravel parking lots weren't good for her car. And they took my parking spot away and gave it to her. Yeah, that'll piss you off. Man, I'm reminded actually of this one time in college, I was talking to my roommate and, he, and I'd be angry all the time. And I remember asking him, I'm like, Sean, how come when I'm always angry at you, you just stay so calm and cool and I remember he told me, he's like, well, Charlie, I always take my anger and I go uh, let it out later. And so I'm like, man, I want to know, how, how do you do that? And he said, man, here's what I do. Every time I'm angry at you, I just go clean the toilets. So I'm like, how does that help you not be angry? He said, because I use your toothbrush. I'm just kidding. Okay, that story's not true. Well, it's kind of true. I was always angry in college and Sean wasn't, but he didn't clean the toilet with my toothbrush. But the point I'm trying to make is I feel like I'm qualified to talk on anger if nothing more than I'm angry all the time. But really I'm qualified to talk on anger because God's word is what we're going to talk about and God's word is going to speak to us. And so some of you right now, you may be quick to spot your anger like me. Because you look at it and you go, man, aggressive anger, I get it. You, you yell, you fight, you speak hate, you use ugly language and, and push and shove, all these things, right? You see aggressive anger. And some of you might show in a different way. It's more passive. You choose the whole cold shoulder approach, right? I'm not going to talk to you anymore or, or even better, you unfriend them on Facebook. Some of you block their number or you remove them from their, your social circle because you turning away your presence is punishment enough for that person, or maybe you're one of these people and you say things like, I'm not angry, I'm just frustrated. Or I'm not angry, I'm just trying to vent. Or maybe I'm not angry, I'm just having a bad day. Or how about this one? I'm not angry, they just suck. <laughs> Here, here's what it is. No matter what category you fall into, whether you're aggressive in your anger or you're, you're passive in your anger, uh, no matter where you are, or maybe you're just in total denial about your anger, uh, we all have anger in our lives and things that we want to work on and work through. 
And so for whatever reasons you have that anger, no matter what they are, maybe you have a good reason, but you don't handle your anger right. The key to processing through our emotions is by allowing the Lord to speak to us. So right now, that's what I want to do. I just want to pray for those of you in Columbia, those of you in Spring Hill. I want to pray that the Lord would speak to us. So let's do that. Bow your heads with me. God, thank you so much for your word, for conviction, for honesty, God. And I pray right now that you would speak to us, that your words would speak to us, God, that you would speak to me. You would help me uh, to learn what my anger is telling me about my heart. And every bridge student in this room, God, you, we would learn what you are trying to tell us about our hearts. In Christ's name we pray, amen. All right, we're gonna jump into Ephesians today. So if you have your Bibles, open them right now to Ephesians chapter four. We're gonna start in verse 26. Uh, just so you know, Paul is writing the book of Ephesians. Uh, it's a letter at the time, and he's writing it to a church. He's writing it to people a lot like me and you, a, a body of believers gathered together, and he's writing them this letter. And here's what he had to say to this body of believers. He said, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Man, I, I just want to stop right now. See, because this verse is so in interesting to me, but it's a ridiculous rule, and here's why. It's a ridiculous rule because it says, be angry and do not sin. Are you kidding me? I, I don't know about you, but how can you be angry and not sin? And, but, but he's telling us to do that. Uh, some of you may know this, some of you may not, but uh, Buddhists, they actually put a very high priority on removing emotions completely. Like you have reached the highest level of virtue if you can remove and suppress all emotions in, in your life. Uh, you may not know this, but as Christians, that's not our goal. Our goal is never to remove emotions, but to process them in the correct way. We'll see here in a minute that anger is something that Jesus experienced. Uh, so anger isn't necessarily a bad thing. We're not trying to remove it. We're just trying to deal with it. But still, a ridiculous rule, be angry and do not sin. So I, I heard a quote that said this way. It says, anger is a destructive energy released. You probably can relate to that. When you're angry and yell at someone, you are releasing a destructive energy. I'm gonna tear you down. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be meaner than you. I'm gonna say the worst thing, right? This destructive energy released. Or maybe your anger and destructive energy released is more passive, right? It's like, we aren't friends. I hope you suffer. It's a little more quiet and subtle, but you're still going after this thing. Uh, but that's not the whole quote. Anger is a destructive energy released in defense of someone or something you love. Pastor J.D. Greer said that. And so I found this interesting because he's trying to point out that anger can be a good thing when it's in defense of someone or something you love. Uh, here's an example of it. I mean, if, if you have a loved one who has cancer, you are angry at cancer, you hate cancer, you're upset about what that means for their life, it bothers you, it saddens you, uh, and chemo is a very, very destructive energy. Chemo is dangerous and deadly, but it is a destructive energy. It says a destructive energy released in defense. That chemo is released in defense of that person you love. It is trying to remove that thing that's killing the person you care about. We care so deeply about our friends and our family. There are times that something happens to one of them and our immediate response is defense, to go out and protect them and keep them safe. Man, I remember this one time. Uh, I was 18 years old and I was at a Bruno Mars concert with my older brother, uh, who would have been 20 at the time, and my little brother, who would have been 15 at the time. And I don't know if you can tell from the camera angle you're looking at, but I'm a pretty scrawny dude. I'm not very big. And uh, believe it or not, I was even smaller back then but I'm the biggest of my three brothers. Uh, and at this concert, uh, we're just rocking out, enjoying a little Bruno Mars. And next thing I know, the people in front of us start to get ugly. As a matter of fact, one of them looks at my older brother and tells him to shut up or I'm gonna fight you. I, we're like, whoa, what's happening here? Uh, turns out these guys were all drunk, but they were trying to fight us. And so instantly, me and my brothers, then we took up arms, we're, we're about to throw down. And these are some good old country Alabama backwoods boys that are about 6'10", 295, not muscle, they're just 295. But me and my brothers, all three added together, probably weighed under 300 pounds altogether. These dudes are 300 pounds a piece, but we're ready to fight, man. We're ready to go to town because... We care about each other. We're, we're, we're willing to release a destructive energy in defense of someone 
or we love. Uh, thank God we didn't have to fight. Security came and took him away, but we were ready. We were ready to throw down. So, but Jesus, we see that Jesus does this obviously in the best way possible. We know Jesus went to the cross without sin. Therefore, the times he was angry, he wasn't sinning and doing it. Uh, we see in Matthew 21 that Jesus goes into the temple and there at the front of the temple, there was a, an area that was for the poor, uh, that was for the unchurched. It was an area where everyone could come in. Anyone belonged, no matter what. And uh, in the temple, at this spot, the Pharisees began to sell things. They began to trade and they made this the place to make money. They made it about profits. And we know that Jesus went and he was angry, flipping tables, you know, pushing stuff. It, the, the word actually says he drove them out with a whip. I don't know about you, but if you're chasing somebody with a whip, you got to be angry. And so here, just a little side note, don't go home chasing your brother or sister around with a bull whip and saying that Jesus did it and so can you. That's not the case, right? Jesus did it without sinning. And the difference is, is that what his anger was defending was God's will. What his anger was defending was something holy and righteous. And so my question is, what is our anger defending? See, because remember, this series, isn't a, it's not about the smoke, but the, the smoke leads to the fire on our heart. Anger can be selfishly motivated or righteously motivated. Jesus obviously had a righteous motivation in his. Uh, look at it this way. You're driving down the road. Have you ever been driving down the road and there's a car in front of you going too slow or in the way and you're mad? And so whether you're driving or someone else is, you want to blow the horn. You want to yell at them, right? You want to give them the one finger wave. Stop it. Get out of my way. <laughs> That's selfishly motivated. You think where you're going is more important than where they're going. Or the big one for me, y'all, this is the, the big one for me. People texting while I'm talking to them. It drives me nuts. If I'm talking to you, why would you be texting? Why don't you pay attention to me? And, and that could be righteously motivated, right? Like I care about your well-being and your relationships. I want you to prosper and grow, but that's not it. I'm angry at you for texting while we're talking because I think I'm the most important thing. You should pay attention to me. You should ignore everyone else. I am the priority. I am of the utmost importance. It's, it's very much selfishly driven. It's not out of love for someone else. And so we have to look at our anger through the lens of our love because when our love is out of order and it's selfish, so will our anger be based in selfish desires. So what do we do to fix our anger? We fix our love. Uh, the verse we were reading in Ephesians chapter four, we're gonna pick back up now in verse 28. It says, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Man, this verse is setting us up to stop doing something and start doing another. See, it isn't simply enough for the thief to stop stealing. He has to start working, right? Because stealing is motivated by what? Greed, laziness, selfishness. But laboring is motivated by honesty and hard work. See, what, what, what Paul is trying to point out, it's not just about stop being angry. It's time to start doing something. He's saying, stop the anger, fix the love. One is the easy way out, right? The easy way out uh, is just to keep being angry. The other is gonna take effort. It actually takes your effort to stop being angry and start doing something else. Selfish anger is about promoting yourself and your desires, but righteous anger is about promoting others and their well-being. Verse 29, it goes on in scripture. It says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear it. How many of us, the first response in anger is words of frustration, right? We want people to hear our words of how much they suck, how terrible they are, how they've done us so wrong. Y'all, yesterday, my little girl, she's five, was angry because she wasn't allowed to do something. So she looks at my wife and says, I hate you, and storms off. We didn't teach her that. But her first response is words that are corrupt, words that are unkind. She naturally responds with that. We didn't teach her that. So what is this corrupting talk? The Greek word is sapras. And that Greek word means bad or putrid, like rotten fruit or fish. It's saying these words that are disgusting, they're foul, they're unclean, they need to be thrown out, right? They, they shouldn't be around. 
And maybe for you, the words don't come out towards the person. Maybe for you, your words come out when you share it with someone. You go back to a friend or a mentor and you're venting, or maybe you're doing it in your small groups. You're, you're venting about a problem, but what you're doing is you're, you're spewing corrupt talk to those around you. Words that don't build up, they actually tear down. So remember, it's stop doing something, start doing the other. We're going to stop corrupt talk, right, the, the hateful, mean speech, but we're going to start with words that build up and give grace. Speaking words that benefit others, not yourselves, uh, it can be difficult. And I don't know about you, but it can be very, very difficult when you're angry. Uh, you may have uh, heard a passage in scripture before where Jesus was talking at one point, and he tells his disciples, if someone strikes your cheek, turn the other cheek. And Jesus was not referring to a fist fight. Jesus was not saying, if you get in a fight, let them punch you, turn, let them punch you again. See, in this time, the face was a representation of the relationship. So what Jesus was saying is, is if someone attacks you, if someone attacks the relationship, turn the other cheek and continue in the relationship. Continue to be there and a part of that. Do the right thing. Don't, don't give up, but be a part of it. And we all know that that's not easy. It's not easy when someone offends you to be a part of that, to, to speak kindness, to speak uplifting true things to them. Paul, in the verse we just read, he says to say things that are uplifting as, as, as fits the occasion. I think Paul is saying that because sometimes it's not possible. There are some situations where it's not possible to speak that grace or truth, uh, but it is possible to not be negative. Paul recognizes sometimes it will be hard to respond, and you may have heard your mother say this before, but if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. I think Paul's pointing to that same idea that, that there are times it will be too hard, it will be better to just say nothing at all. Let's keep reading on what we should stop doing and what we should start doing. Uh, in verse uh, 31 here. It says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Then Paul talks about bitterness here because he knows it forms quickly in anger. When you're mad at someone, when you're frustrated, what's going to happen quickly is you're going to be bitter towards them. You're going to resent them. You're not going to want to be around them. You're going to think every negative thing you possibly can about that person. But here's what happens is when you hold on to what someone did, they won't pay the price you will. You will be the one who pays the price for that bitterness, for that anger. See, forgiveness is what brings freedom offered in Christ. Y'all, I learned this lesson hard again yesterday. God's been showing me over and over in life how this statement is true, and I forget it, and I even forgot it yesterday. So long story short, uh, a couple months ago, my wife and I, we bought a, a horse for our farm. Uh, it turns out the horse had a lameness in its leg and wouldn't run, run the right way. So we reached out to the people that we bought the horse from and told them what was going on. And, and they're like, oh yeah, we'll refund your money. We'll get it taken care of. And they, they, they were going to make it right. And so we're like, oh great, this is going the right way. Uh, but Monday... Uh, in a conversation, they basically said they never told us they gave us their money back. It's our fault. We hurt the horse and all this. So they began to blame us. They began to, to twist and lie about the story. Yo, I'm not gonna lie to you. I got super angry. I got frustrated. I began to attack him. I said, man, you don't have integrity. You're not a good person. I even went online to post reviews about them. I'm like, these people don't trust them. And, and what happened is my anger was selfishly motivated. I only cared about me and the money that I had lost. And so I began to attack them and bitterness built up. This isn't fair. This isn't right. And I was frustrated about the whole situation all while writing this sermon, right? And I'm frustrated about it. I'm angry. I'm like, you're going to pay the price. Your business is going to suffer, right? I thought like the justice is mine. I'm going to take care of this. I'm going to fix this problem. And, and that's all I'm wrestling with all day, all night, Monday night, all day, yesterday on Tuesday. And then yesterday on my drive home from work, God reminded me, that I'm the one who's bitter and I'm the one who's sinning now. So I picked up my phone, I called the, the young man, and I just told him, I said, hey man, I'm really sorry that I attacked you. I'm sorry that I'm bitter, I'm sorry that I'm frustrated. I just wanted to apologize to you. All right, thanks, have a great day, bye. And I hung up. 
That was it, right? And, and, and you're like, how the heck is that possible? Oh, is it, it's because you're, it sounds too good to be true. You're just a, a professional Christian. You're a pastor. Man, you can do those things. Man, I'm telling you this story because I can't really do those things. I'm not good at that. God has to remind me while I'm writing a sermon on anger that anger is wrong. And so if we're going to start doing something and start doing another, we first, we get how that's possible at the end of this passage. We just read verse 32. Here's the end of verse 32. It says, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. See, the, the trick to this whole process is that it's not based on our forgiveness. It's based on the fact that Christ forgave us. We have to remember that we were First sinners and second sinned against. It's about changing our perspective and remembering where we've been and where we're going. We go into the other the situations thinking, man, the other person is wrong. The other person made the mistake. The other person is dishonest, disloyal, rude, hateful, mean, arrogant, ignorant, whatever it is. We go in thinking, I have the right to this anger because you have wronged me. I am allowed to fight you. I'm allowed to, to say these things about you. But that's not how God looks at us. See, God looked at us and said, you are a sinner but I gave everything for you. And through Christ, we have forgiveness. And that's the perspective we have to remember that no matter what anyone does against you, we have done more against God and he didn't hold that against us. See, we aren't judge of the world because we can't be. It's not possible. We're, we're biased. We want our way. We don't look at the whole picture. We don't see everything happening, but God does. God is righteous and a just God. He cares about every situation you're in. He cares about the moments that you experience, the hurts that you feel, and your anger isn't necessary. Mine isn't either. Romans 12, 19 says, Beloved, never avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, God said, Vengeance is mine and I will repay. See, God's looking out for you. God cares about you. Our anger is vindictive. It's about getting back at somebody, but the Lord's is redemptive. The Lord's anger wants to see people go from bad to good, to sinners to forgiven. He cares about their future, right? Our anger lingers and it, it sometimes seems to never leave. The Lord's anger is short. Our anger is random and emotional at times. The Lord's is controlled and precise. So you may be asking, well, well, how do I know if my anger is righteous or selfish? How do I know if, if my anger is allowed or appropriate or if I should work on this or change this? How do I know that? Here's how I would tell you to, to figure that out. Process your anger in community in comparison to God's word. Guys, the reason we go to small groups is to have conversations like this. So here in just a few minutes, we're going to go and we're going to talk about anger Shame and envy, they're easy to spot in your life. It's easier to see and know when you feel those things. But an unrighteous anger is often hard to spot by you and easily spotted by others. Usually, you're the last one to see your own anger. So small groups, I mean, we should be able to say these things to one another. Speak to one another about, hey, I was angry. Can you all help me? Or or speak kindness when someone has experienced that. I want you to know this is a place where you have to be honest and vulnerable. This is a place you have to be willing to receive feedback. But as a group, you have to be kind and honoring. This isn't a chance for you to get gossip on another person and go back to school and talk about them. This is a chance for you to listen to understand, not just listen to be understood. Y'all, some of it is so hard to, to offer forgiveness because you've never received it. Many of you tonight, you just need to start by realizing you have carried the weight of everything you've done and you don't have to. You are a sinner, but God has forgiven you. That's all yours. That's free for you. God cares about you. And some of you, it's hard to do this because you've become so focused on your Christian walk that you forgot that the Lord has done everything in you. We all have to remember that we're able to do this because we were first sinners and second sinned against. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for loving us when we're sinners, for caring about us when we're broken and flawed. 
God, your word says you died, your son died on the cross for us while we were sinners. And I pray that you would teach us about that. So we would remember when we encounter frustrations and anger that you didn't display that towards us. You displayed love. God, help us to process our anger. And if, if something is wrong in our hearts, Lord, let us fix it. God, we love you so much, but you love us so much more. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.